Good morning. My name is Kelly Duncan, President and CEO of Colorado Gives Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Annual Investment Meeting. I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for entrusting us to be a part of your philanthropy. Whether a donor advised fund holder or a nonprofit endowment partner, you're doing important work to make good happen in our communities. Our annual investment meeting is a little bit informational and a little bit inspirational. We'll start with information about how our investment process works, some insight into how we think the markets will perform in 2024, and a look back at how investments performed this past year. Then we'll be inspired with stories from nonprofit endowment partners about the success they've had in engaging donors to contribute to their long-term success. We're also excited to unveil new ways to build sustainable futures with exclusive opportunities for Colorado Gives Foundation endowment partners. Each year, Robert Morris from Greystone Consulting shares how investments performed in the previous year and previews what we anticipate in the year to come. Before we jump into the review and preview of investments, I thought I'd do the same and share what 2023 looked like for Colorado Gives Foundation and what we're looking forward to in 2024. So in 2023, we changed our name. We are now proudly Colorado Gives Foundation. We also created an impact investment fund called the Bring It Home Fund, where we seeded it with $15 million that we will use to provide below market rate debt or equity investments to either preserve or increase the supply of housing that's affordable for Jeffco residents making about fifty-two dollars to $150,000 a year. We hope to continue to grow that fund and continue to make investments. And with you, Colorado raised $54 million on Colorado Gives Day. And don't forget, Colorado Gives Day this year is December 10th. So looking ahead, I already previewed that we want to continue to grow the Bring It Home Fund with additional donors, and we will continue to make investments from that fund to preserve or increase the supply of housing affordable for individuals and families in Jeffco. We also created the Pathways to Prosperity Fund that will support efforts that are preparing Colorado residents for in-demand, good-paying jobs through programs like Cross Purpose or Activate Work. We're excited to continue our efforts with partners and the Triad Bright Futures Roadmap to build a quality early childhood system in Jeffco. And as we continue to invest in projects that will preserve or produce housing that's affordable, we'll continue to work with our local elected officials, our local mayors, our housing advocates to agree on an agenda that we can all support together to ensure we have housing affordable for Jeffco. And we're excited to unveil improved nonprofit endowment program, which Tim Zexer will talk about more today. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dale Martin. Dale is the treasurer of our board and also the chair of our finance and investment committee. Dale joined our board and he's been a passionate and contributing member since January 2021. He brings extensive finance experience to the foundation he, was the man, he is the managing director of Great Mountain Partners, an asset management firm providing tailored investment solutions to institutional investors. And prior to this, he spent 12 years as the director of private markets at the Fire and Police Pension Association of Colorado and 12 years as vice president private equity for Hexagon Investments. So thank you, Dale, for your service to Colorado Gives Foundation and for being with us today. Join me in welcoming Dale. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, each year, we hold this meeting specifically to review in order for you to get a chance to hear from the experts in our consultant firm, Raystone Consultant. They're the ones who help us manage our investment programs. Um, and it's, today is really important because it's designed to give you an opportunity to get answers to the questions that you may have. So please, if you have something that's important to you understand today, make sure that you ask about the question. Um, I have the privilege today of introducing Mr. Robert Morris, who is the representative from Greystone. And um, before I do that, though, I do want to share just a bit of a brief overview of the finance and investment. So the committee is responsible for the overall um, oversight of the financial health of the foundation. We 
It's comprised of nine extremely qualified and dedicated individuals who bring their expertise to bear for that purpose. We meet on a quarterly basis, and at those quarterly meetings, we really have three key functions. The first one is to oversee the foundation's financial report. The second one is to look at the budgeting process. And finally, to be aware of and pay attention to the investment performance. Those are the key three key functions of the finance investment. Um, the committee itself worked closely with staff of the foundation, as well as Greystone, to perform these functions. Greystone itself is a division of Morgan Stanley, and they act as our outsourced CIO. We chose Greystone because it gives us many advantages, including access to the full depth of resources, all the talent and resources of Morgan Stanley, an actively managed, well balanced investment portfolio, and more comprehensive monitoring and reporting on our portfolio. And hopefully that results in better returns for you. Um, before we get to today's presentation, I do have one reminder and one encouragement. The reminder is that you can reach out to Ken, to Kelly, to Tim, or any one of us if you have any questions at any time. And the encouragement is to take this time to ask the questions that you have so you can get the answer that you need. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Morris from Greystone. Um, before we do that, just a bit of background. So Robert is the Senior Vice President, and he's been affiliated with Greystone since 2003. He's over 15 years of investment experience, and he specializes in portfolio construction, asset management, as well as alternative investments. He works closely with Morgan Stanley's Information Resources Group in order to ensure that his clients are working with only the best class investment managers. He also helps his clients draft investment policy statements, coordinate patent allocation recommendations, and assist clients with the portfolio implementation. Robert? Yes, Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's certainly good to see some familiar faces from uh, previous meetings. And amazing, honestly, how quick a year has gone by. You know, just reflecting the other day, we were talking about some of the uh, response to uh, market challenges and so forth. It's amazing what a difference although a year will make. There we go. Perfect. Okay, so exactly as uh, Dale said, just uh, one quick recap if you're not familiar with how our firm is structured. We are operating in what we call an OCIO capacity for the foundation. So we'll help uh, advise on investment policy. That's the responsibility, though, of the, the finance committee, ultimately the board. But then within the confines of ranges, Within that portfolio, that's where we'll make salvation decisions, underlying investment uh, decisions. It does take village. You see me often at these meetings, but trust me, there's a whole host of people behind the house that uh, make the uh, make everything work. Sudan Linguist, chair of uh, one of our endowment foundation portfolio management groups, works with us closely as well. So, with, with all that being said, let's kind of dive into. Now, what an interesting, certainly end to the year. One thing when we look at market performance for last year that will immediately jump off of this page look at the performance of the NASA 55% gain. We're going to talk at length about this because clearly we've had call it an AI boom, almost getting into an AI mania type territory with a few key technology companies. That has also pulled up most of the performance of other uh, equity indices too. Good same kind of indices there on the right, you'll see the Bloomberg, US aggregate, we kind of use that as a short bond market. That actually lodged a positive of 5.5% last year. Kind of your, your average diversified portfolios typically be around the 11 to 12% range is what we're seeing uh, on this year. But it's so interesting, even with that 55% performance from the NASDAQ, uh, trust us, it had a long way to go to get back to even. What we've got here on the screen right now is you're looking at essentially the last three years, because really we've gone from a top to a bottom to a top again over that time period. And in fact, the S&P has only just crossed above the uh, high that was reached back in October 2021. Now, I do like to say that this is kind of usually, you know, our job is very complex. 
obviously we made projections out of the upsell basis, seven year, 20 year. That's kind of when I, I jokingly will tell again, it's not our crystal ball, that's less foggy. Because you can look at things like long term growth of demographics, growth of productivity, and so forth, and make reasoned assumptions long term. Near term, you know, tactical decisions, 12 to 18 months, that more fraught with the challenge. This is exactly why. So we kind of lived through the post COVID stimulus boom to then the, oh goodness, we caused inflation, let's not a hyperinflation, let's have that 22 decline to now a, we seem to have things under control, recovery by the, by the end of last year. And speaking of by the end of last year, this really will tell you two thirds of the US equity market performance last year is really just from October 27 onwards. The critical turning point to that was we, we hit a magic crossover number. And I think I remember talking about our last annual meeting. What the Fed will always historically try to do to combat inflation is raise rates until the base rate is above that of inflation. Because if you get to that level, you're not penalizing savings anymore while you are actually, you should be removing stimulus or liquidity markets at that level. Well, we hit that crossover point back in October when we had 3.9% the inflation reading at the time. That was celebrated because it's not 9% <laughs> so that early. So all of a sudden, then you start to see the equity markets take off and the bond markets take off. There might have been a little bit too much optimism built in around those times, as I'll talk about here in a second. So we have... At the beginning of each year, firms like ours and our loan investment markets will try to, with a very well-reasoned assumption set, say, what's our base case going to be for the year? And we'd like to make sure that about 60% of the probability is that basic. And then we'll stress test it and say, all right, what if everything goes wrong? There's our bare case, we'd like to have a 20% probability for that. And then what if everything goes right? That's our bull case. 20% probability of science of that. Last year, if you look at the, you know, these four charts at the moment that I walk through, we hit that whole case basically of everything that could go right at the end of last year did. So we say, thank you very much. That's nice. That obviously helps uh, performance here, as I'll show you in a moment. First and foremost, sorry, first and foremost, GDP. It was theorized by many that we were actually having a, a consumer that would kind of tap out at some point last year, say, no matter if I can spend all I needed to, and Virgo, we were going to see a slowdown in growth. But we actually didn't. The consumer stayed strong. And in actual fact, the last couple of quarters, we had really high GDP prints. In fact, so much so that here's one of the good news I'll, I'll leave you with today. Our firm has changed its forecast for the next couple of years out in 2025. We're back into that one to two percent plot along normal growth environment because it seems like most of the bad news that could happen to GDP has been unveiled. So has all of the good news. We've actually kind of gotten through some of those post COVID era stories. I already mentioned we had the, the, the positive of real yield. Fed actually achieving what they wanted to, which was when we got to that five and a quarter to five point five percent level with a three point nine percent inflation. Right, you have a positive real yield now. That is historically the point where the Fed pauses. Have done so that was viewed as as positive. Now, one of the critiques of that is how are you going to cure inflation and raise interest rates without? You know, breaking some eggs here. You can't make normal without breaking eggs. You shouldn't be able to do that without causing unemployment. It's almost like unemployment was going to be a feature, not a bug, of the Fed's program. So many will say, well, we're keeping unemployment above the 4% level. But seven is actually where it ended last year. We did indeed see companies do, you know, right sizing measures. There were layoffs. But broadly, there was still enough jobs left to soak up some of that. The headline unemployment figure 
is 3.7. Um, earnings per share growth is the final positive surprise here on the bench. So here's the other trick as well. Going into this, uh, going into 2023, we knew that companies had had incredible revenue growth in that post-COVID boom. Because if you all remember, we did 21, 22. There were a lot of stimulus checks, a lot of savings in the bank, and the consumers were saying, I just want to buy something. Doesn't matter what it is, I'm price insensitive. I don't care if that new fridge is going to cost me ten, you know, hundred dollars more than, than it should. I still need that fridge in the fire. So companies got a little bit lazy on their bottom line. Basically, if you have great top line revenue growth, your margins look okay anyway. But when that top line revenue growth subsides, or at least a year goes by, then you do have to watch the bottom line. And that's what we were anticipating companies to do in 2023. They did. That was the layoffs and so forth that we saw. And that did indeed cause a drop in corporate earnings last year. So incredible. We're talking about insane levels of market growth, but yet with corporate earnings that actually did decline for the, uh, the first three uh, quarters. The, the clear numbers for those of that is those declines weren't as here. I do have on this chart here just for comparison the profitability decline in 2020 just so you can see the level that those reached. And instantly at a glance, you can see well, it wasn't as bad as all that. And so, hence, less bad news is actually viewed as good news for the market. And those I will hit right now. Another good thing for the market going forward, Dick. Look at these projections out here that we get growth. Because we stabilized essentially a good part of the economy, normalized GDP growth, the visibility does look better for earnings going forward. Companies have indeed got their profit margins where they wanted them to be. Most companies, 493 companies to be exact. There's seven that's going to be an exception to this rule here that we'll, that we'll talk about here in a moment. So you saw the results of the announced that earlier. There are seven key tech companies. Most folks in my profession have kind of talked ad nauseum about those. Just out of interest, you know, Facebook, aka Meta, Google, Apple, Nvidia, Tesla, um, that cohort basically with Microsoft. That cohort uh, is what's been termed the magnificent seven because all of those companies had extraordinary earnings growth as a result of. AI adoption. Generative AI that became mainstream at an early point last year, part time in 22, but became mainstream in 23. And then companies kind of almost got themselves into AI models. Basically, like, oh my goodness, my competitors invested in that level of data center. If I could put me out of business, I'm going to have to do the same. And it caused this kind of feedback loop. So, what we saw was Growth companies versus the value of that. You know that uh, a value company is you know, a traditional a material, industrial, a healthcare company, something like a Caterpillar or a Johnson & Johnson, for example. Value companies, I you think something is 8% year. In any other year, we'd be saying, that's great, thank you, that's what we, that's what we wanted. Growth, 42%. Again, that, uh, that skew was caused by the Magnus um, now, here's another thing though that's slightly worrying about the skew. Investor expectations tend to run away with themselves. So the minute you announce, oh, I've got great growth from this new product, okay, let's extrapolate that out and plan the next five years worth of growth to that and try to bring that into the stock price today. The classic example of this is a bit of a fun side story from the dot-com era, year 2000. There was one analyst who was famously analyzing Worldcom. You remember that company that didn't really make this name, but Worldcom laying all of those, you know, transatlantic pipes and so forth. And they were projecting the number of Worldcom suppliers. This is where you know, good Excel goes bad. The growth rate that they had used, they projected the population of the world was only going to be, you know, 7 billion people, that there were going to be about 10 billion Worldcom subscribers. So more than the population of the entire world. So that 
tends to happen, unfortunately, in Wall Street. So we get these projections that run away with themselves. And that leads to high valuations. So valuation for the non-investment professionals simply take your prices that you pay by buying the earnings that you're going to achieve. Imagine each stock that you buy is kind of like a vending machine. You pay a hundred bucks for it, you're going to get five dollars per year out of sales from that, and the EPS of five. Price divided by earnings, use that value as a times multiple, then just pay for that vending machine. 20 times, by the way, it's not, it's historical when you add in what happened with the Magnificent Seven now, we're at 31 and a half. So, again, companies like NVIDIA that trade at a seven times forward price to earnings policy. Microsoft even trades at about 35. So, even these big mega companies can get into these high value situations, which doesn't necessarily end well all of the time. I'll get into here in, in, in a moment. Oh, one other cliff notes, and this kind of came up at a meeting I was, I was doing yesterday, so I want to see it too. VIX, uh, the VIX is what we call the volatility index. It is a short for fear or complacency. So a higher VIX, you know, I know we went to 22 on this chart here, but you can see in early 23, we had a VIX of 27. Just to give you a more historical context, in 08 and 90, had a VIX of about 70 extreme fear levels. Today, we're trading at what would best be described as extreme complacency. So those are typically moments where we in the investment committee always like to just say, all right, look over our shoulder, what's, what are we missing here? What could potentially go wrong to be of that? So it is a cautious point that we are at that extreme level of complacency. So back on to, I'm going to skip this slide here and go on to this. So back onto the Magnificent Seven discussion point. Last, last slide on this here too. So how are those companies able to pull the index as high as they have done? The answer is the concentration. The US S&P 500, you know, the hand, the US large cap index, 33.7% is Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, the Magnificent Seven companies. So, here's another last side too. NVIDIA now, after its last growth level that we just saw, has crossed the market capitalization of Canada and Germany. So, one company basically valued more than two fairly massive economies. So, doing something right in chip sales. So, there is that uh, level of mania that can come in. And, and this is what I want to talk about here specifically is competitive risk. So arguably, what the market's missing is those companies all do the same thing. So Microsoft sells data storage, cloud, uh, AI access. NVIDIA has been getting into the uh, data storage and cloud business. It's been easier thing for them to do. Heavens, you're making all of those machines and servers. Why not offer the host somebody for those? It's a very easy move. That causes you know, competitive risk between the two of them. And there's another chip company, AMD, which is obviously making on the heels. AKA, we live in a world where Coca-Cola doesn't stay in one company that delivers soap. You very soon get a Pepsi, and then you get a Dr. Pepper, so forth and so forth. We're kind of right at that cost in the market now where we're going to see these competitors for data storage, AI, and so forth. In fact, the only thing that gets a billionaire out of bed and into the workforce. We had uh, Sergey Brin, the founder of Google, who's so terrified of uh, competition that he's basically gone back to work. Because if you think about it, Google's core business, which Google is a member of, it's like a set by the world, their core business is search and ad revenue off of the search. Well, you know, use Google as an adjective. They can't can you Google that for me. Well, don't need to do that if we have an AI assistant to say, hey, what's this business? And it'll just do it for us. So it, it strikes at the core of Google's business, aka, you know, we're going to decision making. What you're going to see is that magnificent seven will quickly become three or four. 
we may have already started to see that happen in January because here's the other trick. When you have a high valuation and you have so much future baked into you know, the price that you're paying for a company now, if you don't deliver on that by one head, if you miss or guide lower, stock price will be used. Uh, Tesla is a good example of that. At the beginning of this year, Tesla actually has a decent earnings announcement, but they've guided more cautiously for the year, starting with around 25 percent like that. So as easy as you have these concentrations to pull up market values and capitalization weighted, the same works in reverse. And the natural facts demonstrate that with several different reasons. Rather than one down to growth, one down to value. Look at the extremes of when they trade places. Oh, by the way, here's 99, 2000. Uh, World Com Analyst projecting this 10 billion subscribers. And then all of a sudden, the very next year, you have these incredible outperforms by the other companies that have been left behind. So that's one thing that we really have to be mindful of in this day and age that the other 493 companies out there are doing very good things. And also, there are going to be winners in the AI space that aren't necessarily just the providers of this. Think about um, you know, United Airlines, for example. They are the same. We've been getting more and more text messages from them, you know, talking about, oh, watch out for this in flight, or maybe you should put this out on. Those are all AI generated. You know, they're able to save um, you know, a lot of expense on customer service to improve their service by giving to AI. That's an example of a company that can improve its targets. American Express, um, call center providers, medical billing. The hooks are actually more than likely going to be the end winners of this AI group that we're in. And right now, the market is only recognizing chips. Sort of so, so. Thank you. Um, so, I'm also often asked now, hang on, last year, shifting gears now onto the Fed and inflation, and often ask, how can we have such a huge run-up in equity markets last year when when we're supposed to be going through fiscal austerity, pulling away money from the system? Because that's the classic plan. Quite frankly, the Fed did probably spur inflation a little too much, gave on too many stimulus checks that actually caused an inflationary environment COVID. So the classic playbook is, right, well, we're going to take that away. Raise interest rates, fix lending standards, so banks don't lend as much, uh, and basically you stop repurchasing your bonds, you take money away from the system. What they started to do, so here's net liquidity in the overall market. These are figures in trillions of dollars. We had a trillion dollar money supply on net liquidity. And I'm going to hear from 21 years ago, it goes, it's going down, it's going down, it's going down. But in 23, we started to increase the money supply again. Why was this? Well, point number one, in March, we've actually had a step banking crisis, which, by the way, in the size of banking crises, wasn't as big as 08 or 09. Um, Signature Bank, First Republic, out in California. All of those banks, the same size as the values and so forth, that were, you know, um, the boss went through the challenges of the way. So we had to follow the classic playbook to say those banks that had, well, not call them dump bonds, but bonds that were supposed to trade 100 cents on the dollar that were on the books of the banks at 85 cents, how do you rescue the bank? You offer to buy those bonds off the bank for 100 cents. You print 15 cents worth of money. To pay for those bonds. So we started to do that. Then here's the other thing. We almost get stuck printing money because we set the interest rate level to five and a half percent. So all of those treasury bond holders out there, we're going to print money now to actually pay the interest on that. The money supply is the army. And last but not least, federal government run to the deficit level. We went through another one of the uh, debt ceiling cycles. Well, every time we do increase the debt ceiling, guess what? So I print more money, that's that. Now, so actually last year, we had an increase in net liquidity. And that typically, whenever you have those increases, that's what sets up for those 
you know, bull run or almost mania style moments. Please note the price of cryptocurrencies today that uh, Bitcoin has crossed 60,000 once again. It's because there's not money going on now to do that. And that is a close parallel really to the Nvidia stock price as well. I want you to look at that. So last year, money printing took hold once again. So all in all, you know, when we kind of start to bring some of this back to portfolio construction and so on, things that we have to pay attention to, that has put us in a spot of higher valuations. You know, this time last year, we were saying, hey, good news, we've actually hit that median level again. And it was feeling a little bit safe to go back into the water and increase some equity allocations. It was for a very small moment until we said, thank you very much. That's great performance from that area. Harvest that, we balance that to try and be harmless. We are one standard deviation overvalued uh, once again as a US equity. That is US only, by the way. I should be clear to say, I don't have this on some of the, the slides here, that the rest of the world is not that expensive. We're only that expensive because we have a lot of those tech companies in our um, indices. You don't necessarily see that in Europe. You can actually find you know, 15 times price to earnings. It's very decent. Japan, about 12 to 13. So this is a, a U.S. phenomenon that's kind of, um, you know, again, it's really just cornered by those, by those tech firms. So we're, we are also often asked, and I'm sure we'll probably get a lot of questions over this as well. So where do we go from here with the interest rate picture? What does the Fed do? Because you can easily see in October, November of last year that basically exuberance that we hit this magic crossover point and all of a sudden, yep, inflation is going to trend completely lower from here on out uh, and the Fed is going to turn around this cutting rate. Well, we were putting words in from Alfred Jerome Powell about it. The Fed and Powell hadn't said that they were going to do that. It was just basically an assumption of the market. And the month of January was all about actually reassembling that expectation because uh, quite frankly, inflation is stubborn. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily go away. And you have some other options now that are coming in. You know, we've got geopolitical concerns. Look at what's going on with shipping there in the uh, the, the, the Gulf area and so forth. It's becoming much more difficult. The price is going up because of that. So it's not going to be time for it. Also, didn't really see that great spike in unemployment as I demonstrates earlier. So a lot of people employed, a lot of wages being paid, that leads to what's called wage push inflation. So the Fed does have to still watch this you know, condition. And we don't necessarily think they're going to do you know 1.5 percent worth of cuts in this year. We think it's probably more like 75 best. And I'll I'll kind of show you here uh, in this next slide. This is what we call the um, the FOMC year-end estimates. Is a summarization of what's called the if you ever hear the term on CNBC the dot plot. So there are these twelve governors basically that will the, each of them vote or make their own assumption on where they think rates should go, and you can basically throw those assumptions all into a blender and you come up with what is called the dot plot or this guideline. Um, expectations. Now, I will tell you that the market expectations, you can calculate what the market believes rates are going to be from certain you know, bonds that kind of trade with those rates in them. The market is anticipating that we're going to get 3.8% by the end of the year. Well, unfortunately, the dot plot would have 4.6. So again, there's too much uh, exuberance in that. And that has implications for how we want to drop your bond portfolio, for example. I'll kind of get into some of that in the, uh, the latter part of the presentation. Also, please note that uh, those, those tech companies that we described earlier, they're, 
they do generally cash flow, but they are typically more geared towards growth. So here's one thing, this mania could continue for a little bit longer even than you might expect, because lower interest rates, easier access to capital, people accept less of the rates of return or rates of kind of out on cash. Those businesses will actually tend to be better in those environments because they'll level up and buy more data centers. So until until that part starts. Uh, this I'll, I'll explain one, you know, this slide can be more complicated. It is probably one of the most complicated that we've got today. So I will try to do my best in lens of startups here for because we need to understand what's called the equity risk free. Back to basics. If you think about it, when you're looking at the, the capital markets, you expect a 5% return from a candidate T bill, for example. You might expect a 6% rate of return for corporate bond. What should you expect from the equity markets? What should we be compensated for taking the risk of owning the business rather than lending? That's what the equity risk premium is trying to show us. Calculation is simple. Now I'm going to go through this here. Take price to earnings, flip that equation the other way around. Do earnings over price, and you'll have a yield from the equity market. And compare that to the yield that you get on the 10-year treasury. So that 10-year treasury right now is about 4.3. So if you have an E divided by P, it will show you, you know, by maybe five and a half percent, five and a half minus 4.3, that's your equity risk premium. And my math is pretty spot on here for the uh, yes. S&P 500 because right now, that equity risk premium is only 113 basis points. So for all the risk that you're taking in the equity market, you're only really getting paid 113 basis points more than you would from the bond market. That's a situation that doesn't sound too painful because the historical average you should be compensated guess what 400 basis points nine is the right number that you want to see out of the equity market if you get getting five from the, the bond market that uh, makes sense it, historically it's intuitive so here's the good news about that i'm showing 493 stops where that is the case and that is so there's, there's another index that's uh it's not publicized as, as widely, but there's two calculations to the US market. There's the SP half weighted, which we're all going to build. That's the 33% of the tech companies. And then there's the equal weight. That simply takes, hey, you can invest $500 in that index, get one. One dollar is going to go to each company, get that. One dollar to NVIDIA, one dollar to Johnson, one dollar to IBM, so forth and so forth. The equity risk premium on those other 493 stocks is represented by the equal weights index in appropriate. It really is just the one of the different between this out of the way. So, in terms of portfolio construction, what we do with that? Well, whenever we, you know, this last year in particular, where we've seen gains from some of those tech companies, we give you the actual portfolio, but we basically said, all right, thank you very much, harvest some of those gains. And we balance out to the safe um, other companies that are present. Mindful of time, but I do want to touch on some of the, uh, the consumers. So, leaving, you know, shifting gears away from some of the, the market and looking more at the, the consumer, and this will kind of be more telling me after the, what will happen next year. I, I should call this slide. Locked in versus locked out because interest rates have actually done an interesting thing for some people in the economy and a totally different thing for others. So, if you've ever wondered, you know, if you've been feeling pretty good about the economy and you're like, oh, what's all the fuck about? Why is my neighbor seemingly upset? It could be on a different side of this. So, locked in, we've had historically low rates. There are a whole swath of the economy. That were able to borrow for a house at three percent, you know, that have a car loan at five percent, let's say, and now they've actually experienced wage growth from the last couple of years. So they're feeling pretty good. 
you know, their monthly outgoings might be two thousand dollars of their income, and that's it. But then there's the other set of people now locked out because we've had rates go so high. You imagine, you know, getting a mortgage now of seven percent. You could be paying double or even triple for the same equivalent house. So honestly, what happened is we split the consumer into two. Five cases of people. So the ones that are locked in, they're apt to spend and participate in the economy. They should have a value of 2024. But the other side, that's a worry. That's honestly, and there's more and more that's going to be getting into that side because. If I look here at the um, effects of race beginning to rise on people, there's a lag effect to what the Fed has done. Because you don't, the Fed changes interest rates, you don't instantly go out and stop your savings, and you stop your mortgage, and so forth. It takes a little bit of time. Well, you actually have some people now that, uh, let's say, Ken's job transferred into New York all of a sudden. Now he's got to sell up here in Denver, buy a house in New York. In a different market, now he's facing a seven percent mortgage rate, but three percent. That's the problem. That's what you're starting to see here. Is this particular chart on the left? Interest payments and the share of disposable income. That number has been steadily rising. It's that phenomenon that I just described. People in the economy that are having to start to move or having to start to refi. It's a draconian example, but there's also other folks that have had you know. An interest rate that's locked in for five years, so that five year clock could be coming up in this year. And ergo, we started to see this effect of race. Guess what? They're coming back to the year 2000, the year 2008 style levels. So that's something to be acutely aware of when we look at you know, revenue for companies. Every dollar that's basically spent servicing debt is a dollar that is not being spent on buying the latest Microsoft outlook, for example. Corporations, same thing's true that companies were, this is one of the reasons, by the way, why earnings per share maybe didn't decline, but in much of it was small previously. Companies are smart about this thing too. They will issue longer term bonds when rates are lower, try to find and sell operations at the cheapest rate possible. They don't want to go into the capital markets and issue new bonds that would cost them seven, eight, nine percent nowadays. Because they've got a 20 year bond that they locked in at 3%. That's also starting to pick up as operations of the business obviously change and continue over time. Now we're going to have that system. So there is also that little uh, change. Personal savings and credit card debt. I showed this slide at the last meeting, so I want to. You know, keep consistent on these annual meetings just to update everyone on where we are today. Yeah, we had a drop down in, in credit card debt, obviously, through 21. Stimulus payments to you know, pay off some of that debt. Now, unfortunately, we hit a new record high of 1.2 trillion in credit card debt. And savings rates, this blip here for the savings rate with all the COVID stimulus monies. Now, unfortunately, savings rate is fairly low. The whole point to these last couple of charts is in 22 and 23, we dodged the bullet because the consumer stayed relatively robust active. If there is another shock, we don't necessarily know that the consumer would actually be able to avoid it or absorb it as far as they had previously. So that is something to keep in mind. Unfortunately, a little bit of cold water onto some of the, you know, the forecast for next year. We're always going to do this kind of balancing act, basically temporary things when we go through these phases. So, crystal wall, as foggy as the next man's on near term, but I thought this would be interesting. And we have a whole host of other um, you know, companies that publish their forecast for next year. So here's the, the clip that was first. To do any of these forecasts, you just go back to that basic what's something worth? What am I willing to pay for a company? What do I think they're going to earn? Price divided by earnings, PE ratio. So here's the PE ratio up here. If we assume, let's go to 20, I'm in the middle of the range. 20 is kind of the historical average now. 
for the US market. And let's say we have earnings per share level of 250 uh, for most companies. That would be a little modicum of growth. That would be the analyst estimates. That would put you at 5,000 SP 500 for the balance of this year. Or 5,070 out of the, the last time I checked. So we're pretty much right there. Again, it's one of these years where we've already hit some of the good news of the projection. However, seven companies again leaving that. What's more than likely to happen this year? And this is our kind of a big general projection for this year. So we will actually see moderation in the program of seven. Basically, they fight each other. You know, NVIDIA can do great, fantastic, but then Google and Apple might slide, for example, and keep that magnificent seven almost in check. But we do believe that investors will actually look and favor some quality and the cash flow coming from those other market sectors, that other 400. So that's what we're really steering part of the portfolios towards today. Other states and so forth. Um, Ken, how are you doing on time? Sorry, I missed that. We've got about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. Okay. I do want to allow some time for QA, so I've probably spent about five to ten just kind of going through some of the forms we've seen. So, what I've got on screen here, we have two portfolios we're going to share with you today, obviously. We have the long term and the short term. So, before I get into the actual numbers as well, let me just kind of set the objectives. The long term, is designed more of what we would call in our world an endowment model. You know, it's one that's designed to keep pace with inflation and provide for regular distributions. That's kind of set forth in, in the overall uh, objectives of this model. And it typically is a balanced model that typically run roughly half equity, 55% equity, and the other half bonds. So last year in particular, Actually, a great year in terms of absolute number, shooting almost the 13th above where we thought that would be. But interestingly, I will say we have a benchmark there at 14. Benchmark, obviously, equity markets that gets all of the benefit of more and more and more of those tech companies. So, what we started to do, obviously, during the year was we balance away from when we actually started to see the market moderate out a look, we, you know, the last quarter of the year, we beat that overall market 8.7 versus 8.4. Long term, by the way, you know, this is interesting. If you look at the some of the calendar year performance from previous years as well, the one thing that I would say about the long term is it is never, it's not designed to be kind of a go go equity market, you know, it's not. Realistically, going to be up, you know, twenty percent in one year or every year, and so forth. It's going to shoot for that schedule, basically, to make sure that we have consistency for those distributions. And that's basically what you can have see over the last couple of years, when there are those more challenging or curious years, twenty twenty and twenty one. Those are the type of years where it should really form, and then did over that time period. And then a year like 23, it's going to generate a good return. It's not necessarily going to keep pace with a tech heavy or becoming tech heavy benchmark. And I think, you know, I do just have a little bit in here in the interest of time, just about attributions. Um, that I can't share it with you here because uh, Kevin and I talked about this the other day. As far as equities in the portfolio, large cap, we are underweight now. Ever so slightly on that large mega cap. And trust us, over the year, that's basically one of the things we constantly have to rebalance that because of the growth of those tech firms. And where we're starting to favor is more on the fixed income side of the market because it's become very clear and knowable in the bond market that you can get a six or even a seven percent of an investment grain bond. That's the perfect trade off versus the potential risk that we see in the equity markets. And that adds to the consistency uh, of that, uh, of our ability to keep pace with those distributions. We're often asked as well active versus passive portfolio as well. It, it's always been a both and approach. There are some markets where we just want to say, 
pain levels, performance of the market cheaply, and typically the best way to do that is passive. So you you will find core position in the US in the passive with the ESG component and in the international markets that happy too. But where we're highly active is everything in fixed income as we can control that rate sensitivity and small and mid-cap and emerging markets. So the balance today is about is about two thirds and one third, uh, pretty much as far as activists answer. We always like to compare just to peer sets as well. And I think showing this risk return chart actually helps drive on the point of where the the Fed that we're trying to hit the uh to hold you down. Volatility is standard deviation is your lower axis, and return is your upper axis. So we've got the, the benchmark on here long term. We just look at all other endowments and foundations kind of in the, the peer set. And what we typically find when we look at these study, we typically have premium performance above the benchmark on the long term and with slightly lower volatility than the peer set. And that peer set, by the way, would include other you know, community foundations, different geographies, and so forth. It's always a, a useful data point to look at. We also like to look at five year chunks for the consistency of spending and distribution. And in this time period as well, and you can see on that growth all chart, the performance basically compounding adds up for you. This was kind of interesting. When I looked at this chart, getting the, the material ready as at the end of the, the year, you basically got, what, 13 years worth of data set now, 13, almost 14 years worth of performance. On that time period, $100 invested long term would have grown to 244, almost 2.4 times return over just a 14 year period. So I know we like to get caught in looking at and then quarter in, quarter out, numbers and so forth. But zooming out, taking a look at that big picture of what that consistency does. Note, you know, we don't necessarily get carried away in the 2021 time periods. We don't really get back too much in the analogy years of 22, but basically we um, compound over time. Last but not least, uh, very quickly, I'm just going to jump into the short term portfolio. Similar theme, by the way, to the last one, this is on page 32. Similar theme to what I mentioned on the long term, but 7.8% on that for the, for the five year. Obviously, the short term is more fixed income, income uh, oriented. And one of the things we'll see again on the short term portfolio, very low standard deviation, you know, designed that way. You know, in, in particular for that, not only consistency, but more the safety uh, aspects is within the short term portfolio. Strong performance over every five year time period. And by the same analysis, that same $100 about 14 years ago would be $182 today. Short uh, Can I maybe one, one quick comment? I, I think that. I've mentioned some of this about leading into the future and positioning. On page 37, you can see some good summarization of the, the comments that we've made. Equity market, we're not as concerned with the other 493 companies. We're fairly confident in, in that area. It should be a normal equity market year for those companies. Big income, we do like, uh, as we obviously can get the higher uh, coupon levels now. Uh, Globally, and I, I think we might, um, you know, touch on not some of this maybe a little bit for this couple of questions that would come on that way. But globally, we do like the what's called reshoring, where we're starting to see those um, economies that basically aren't China or some of the, the nations, quite frankly, who don't like us, uh, moving manufacturing away back here into the US or into friendlier nations, Brazil, Mexico would be you know, good examples of that. That looks to be a good area in the next year too. Um, and I'll tell you what, Ken, I do want to be mindful of the time. How much do we have for Q&A? Uh, yeah, half hour. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, not sure, yeah. That's good, yeah, yeah, let's go to Q&A.
Thank you, Robert. Morning, I'm Ken Curley, the CEO of the Green Color News Foundation. We're now moving from the presentation into an answer session. I'd um, like to questions from folks in the room. If you have questions, feel free to raise it up and just make it collected. We've also collected questions in the past. If you signed up, we had that opportunity. For those, I see already this a question, both for Robert and for some of our staffs. And we are all in the room today. There's a of meeting. So if you have a question on on the name of the giving, if you have uh, comments, raise your hand and bring my Make that part of the conversation. We need Robert to follow a lot. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Well, let's do it in 20 minutes. So we're going to just we're going to start with asking questions just in the interest of moving. Yeah. Um, we're going to start with some that Mark then submitted, and I will quickly while he's answering, look through those that were just submitted. So, Robert, I got a question. So, I'm concerned about the overvaluation of the 2024 market. It's the Fed's or the county bond. And worries that worry about cuts that will happen soon. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I mean, that really is a great question that kind of cuts to the heart of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, the market has become overvalued just because of those few tech stocks. The rest of the market does look okay and not as great sense. So rate sensitive, you know, sensitive obviously to those potential interest rate costs. Um, the, the best information I can give you today on that one is kind of when we look back at that dot plot about the expectations that, you know, I think people have submitted that question is it's certainly well founded because the market is anticipating more cuts than we are likely to get. It's kind of setting itself up for a little bit of disappointment. We saw some of that disappointment trying to price itself into the markets um, at the you know, tail end of January of, of this year. Um, but then beyond that, if we do get 75 basis points worth of cards, which might you know, be you know, starting after June now, it could have been kicked out you know, that, that far. Um, I think because we kind of digested some of that information through the months of January and February, that the market will probably hold in well for that time period. But it should, honestly, it should be a negative against some of the uh, magnificent seven that might be expecting more rate cuts. So again, that kind of adds credence to what I was just saying earlier. You could see investors rotate out of that area and into the less rate sensitive. Thank you, Robert. We're going to give you a break and finish up the questions over there. I'll take that. <laughs> Robert, yes. So, uh, Tim, we have a question. I represent a small nonprofit in Jefferson County. Do you have any tips for helping us grow our endowment? And before you answer, I'd love to open this question to the room. We have a room full of folks who work for and participate in endowments, uh, small, medium, large. So, if anybody has any comments or Judge Tim Zanchel would like to add to it. Um, please raise your hand and we'll have to go through the microphone. Okay. Can you send a question one more time? Oh, I think I got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from everyone, uh, especially um, those who have um, uh, raised money for and uh, grown their endowments. Um, the great news is that the second half of this program will really be diving into the concept of amplifying impact. Um, and we're going to be talking about this and hearing from a couple of really great organizations who've done that. Um, I think to start, though, I would say a um, couple of things. First, uh, every organization is different, and we would love to help. So come and chat with us in the community. Um, because I think we're looking for the answers. One, giving and down really work beautifully together. Um, so Endowments can be a great destination for plan gifts. Um, likewise, having a permanent endowment, having something in perpetuity, can be really attractive to plan giving prospects. So um, that's one big thing that I, I share with a lot of organizations. If you are in the right, um, uh, if, if that's right for you, to, have to start with a plan giving uh, program. 
The second thing is oftentimes we think of endowments as kind of this like, well, this is really boring because the donor gives me a lot of money and then I invest it. Back, uh, and I just kind of go whatever I want to do, like keeping the lights on. I actually would say there's lots of different types of funds that we can structure, or lots of different types of endowments. For example, donors, um, we absolutely can name a fund after donor. It's your mission and mission. Uh, endowments could be for a specific program that, that you um, think has a kind of longevity. So I wouldn't think that it's just. Um, one type of one type of hey, we're gonna lock this away and maybe we'll get a little bit of it later, but really engaging donors, uh, especially ones who care deeply about your organization and can have the sophisticated and the, the see the lasting impact. We're gonna hear a story about exactly that in uh, in just a second too. So um those are two big things I say instead of legacy instead of engaging donors on things that are specifically uh impactful and, and meaningful to them. Uh, and dive into more. And, and as I said, we'd love to help tailor this, especially to the your needs. Thanks, Tim. And again, if anybody's done anything that they've been very successful at, I'm not sure what their colleagues would love to give the opportunity for that conversation. Do we need to take a lot of coffee? Okay, Robert, you're yeah. up. I am done. Just got a question in some minutes, so if I don't get this happily right, please don't ask the question. Feel free to uh, clarify. Um, but one question was submitted in, in advance. What impact do you see from population declines in China? Did you talk about that, Robert? If you could maybe, before just answering the question, go back and give a little background. I'm going to combine that maybe with another question we got around, which is global and geopolitical China. China, yeah, okay. No, <laughs> yeah. So to do the step back on you know why that question, why China? China in particular obviously has a large swath of the world's population, but actually from you know back in the eighties, nineties, not that large a share of the overall market. In fact, you know, very thin on the ground. Hong Kong was basically the, the main access point to it. And then over the last couple of years, we've had a new development of the what's called the China Asia and so forth. And we did see more and more uh, you know, company investment opportunities within China. But the issue that they have run into now is particularly with demographics. China has relied on um, you know, building out cities in advance. And let's be very clear about one thing. So they are what's called a control the economy. So basically the Chinese government says build it and the people say how high. That is the you know it's, it's very straight. And also investment for the average you know individual living in China, the Chinese citizen, is also controlled to a certain degree. They can't like you know you and I we're free to invest in whatever country we want, whatever exchange <laughs> that's not necessarily the case in China. They do have to have a giant account of that held in that way. So what is the classic, typical, easy example of what the you know, government would do and what the average Chinese citizen would do? Public-private partnerships in building real estate projects. It's the cities, literally the roads and highways that you have going out to nowhere. And it was all based upon the anticipation that there were going to be enough people and that the economy would go from a basically a production economy to what we have here in the West, which is a consumption uh, driven economy. 70% of our GDP is based upon consumption. The other way, actually, China has like 30, 70, with the 70 being on production of something to sell to someone, you know, export driven economy. So, in any time, the demographic issue that they've run into. Was that whole you know one China policy? So quite frankly, you're, you're reducing the working age of a, a population, and as you do, you have a aging population. That, by the way, the, the classic way the retirement works in any economy, the whole theory behind it is supposed to be 
you need more productive workers in the field to support your retired population. And you know, productivity is in we can use the chart there as a side. Great. You know, now we're a little more productive and should be able to do more. But in China, again, that's now almost inverted the other way. We're getting an aging population, less workforce. You don't need those cities out in the middle of nowhere. And in fact, some of them have already got to the point that you know they're a building is not used in 10 years, it actually starts to decay. Crumble, this maintenance has started being done. So we might even see those buildings have to be bulldozed before they're put back again. And there is one major tiny property developer, by the way, also a command and control economy. You know, if you don't like the numbers of a command and control economy, that's fine, I'm just not struggling to. And so they might, they won't report the, uh, the statistics. You can't really get a sense necessarily of that it could be. But one sense of starters again is uh, this company called Evergrande, which is a, a big Chinese estate developer. They may have some loans out to those buildings in the middle of nowhere. But obviously, yeah, there's clearly a fault in there somewhere. It's how much that's been propped up. So, okay. My final, there's, there's a lot more than China as well to talk about here too. So China last year was the only emerging market that was negative. I'll go to the one that I didn't sound about 50%, whereas you had um, Mexico was 40, uh, India about the same, and Brazil maybe in the high first. So that's the, the other difference that I talked about with the second part of that question, geopolitics. China made it pretty clear that at some point, they believe that Taiwan is theirs. Um, you could see some form of military action. And we've done a little microcosm of this playbook with Russian securities. Now, Russia was a very small amount of the emerging market in that's about two to three percent. But those companies are completely become stuck when you end up with a you know embargoes or these kind of sanction measures. In, in fact, literally, we've still seen a couple of clients with you know, two or three Russian companies that can't, can't do anything with it. We can't move them, we can't sell them. It's frozen money. So imagine if that happens to China, if there was an invasion of Taiwan, for example, now you're talking more like 10% of the emerging market benchmark that would be stuck. So because of that, there's, there's a ton of fear around that situation. So less investment taking place, adverse demographics, that money's looking for a home in other areas, and it's looking at those friendlier EM and parts of Southeast Asia and so forth. Those type of nations, Japan, uh, is why you're starting to see a resurgence of the Japanese market as well. That's where we're shifting the portfolio of those two things. And was it, did I miss any part of that? There's a lot to that work. I think you have <laughs> You're actually good because I had, I had started the next question, which was the difference in the U.S. data and how might be affected by economies of the rest of the world as well as borders. And I think you got that one too without even having a question in advance. Hey, do you doubt on that? I, I, I'll just come on to the, the war system. I mean, you know, the most unfortunate things that happened to talk about just in markets as well as there's a great human component to that as well. But Essentially, what wars do is they restrict the free flow of capital. They shift things like the supply lines. Of you end up with, um, you know, production bottlenecks and so forth that happen because of that as well. Um, the most recent example that we've seen is obviously shipping costs um, have started to go back up. And it's the insurance uh, that the ships have to pay to travel. Because now that they're going anywhere near a active war zone, there's obviously a greater risk, a greater cost of that insurance. So, yeah, they're not very good. <laughs> if you can avoid them, do so. <laughs> um, okay, so Robert, one more view, and then we'll flip over to Tim. How will the November elections affect the market? Try to stay away from some of the <laughs> Put any in, in the presentation usually. But all right, so I'll, I'll give you that answer in, in two times. Uh, empirical or just kind of quantitative, just looking back in history. And what you tend to find is an election year for the markets 
is not actually that bad. And in fact, they tend to be a little bit above average. Typically speaking, most of that are a lot of years. Um, more fundamental from the performance of a individual company or what a CFO would tell you about their company's operations, a no change status quo is always the, the best move there. Yeah. Or in fact, you know, some kind of division or not that makes it more difficult to make change. And the reason being is it's fairly obvious from the CFO's mind. If I'm looking, for example, at one particular project and I've kind of got it penciled out, well, if the government just changes a letter of the tax code on me or, you know, uh, some part of regulation makes the profit, you know, uh, that, um, that project no longer profitable, then that becomes off the table. So certainty is what businesses prefer the most, which orders for, you know, a divided um, Congress of, of some form, so not a lot after it gets done, or the, the status quo no change. Yes, keep on the Sorry, the short term with that crystal ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Friday and then next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just thoughts on government shutdowns uh, coming up Friday and then next week. Yeah. And that's the, the important part to that, the, the real answer there is yeah. any other time for those shutdown discussions, um, it wouldn't, they get airtime, but not as much as they will this year because it's obviously the election cycle. There's a lot more spending that every politician wants to make and try to use it as a way to get his or her you know, special interest or something taken care of. So um, later on this week, it is going to cause a lot more short-term volatility to target because it will be perceived as a real problem last year. At some point as well, because we do have higher interest rate levels for you know, debt ceiling discussions and so forth, there, there has got to be a point of really addressing that other than just the balance of trade. Because, you know, one thing that they don't tell you that doesn't get the sound advice and so forth is the balance of trade for our economy is actually fairly good uh, versus the rest of the world, i.e., people in other nations want to buy our NVIDIA chips now. Cool. So that means actually we can run. Higher deficit levels because everyone lets us. You know, who, whose fault is it if somebody is it the borrowers or is it the lenders? So in this case, it's kind of become the lenders' fault for the you know allowing us to do things. Are you Tim, next question here. We hear that we are in the midst of a great wealth transfer. We want to benefit from this. How can small nonprofit take advantage? I love it. What a good question. Um, let me start by getting out of the planet screen. <laughs> um, yeah, let me start by sharing why this is a good, smart question to be considered. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple of practical points and, and then also tell you how we can help with this. How many folks follow Giving USA reports um, each year? Because some folks. If, if you do, you remember they, they break out giving kind of by source into four different categories individuals, um, uh, corporate, corporate giving, uh, foundations, and then what they call the quest. And so we're talking about a great transfer of wealth. I immediately start thinking about the quest category. Individuals for the last, I believe, three or so years have been. On the decline as far as the total percentage of the pie. In fact, I believe it this year it did well below 70% for the first time. Um, corporations is really tied with our very much tied with, with our uh, GDP. Yeah, so it's always right around the same couple percentages. Um, it's tied with GDP. Foundations, I think, is is pretty consistent one, just because of a lot of the way that a lot of them are set up. Um, to withstand some some of the volatility of the market, but the bequests are, in my opinion, the most um, stable and have the best trajectory currently. So I think it's very very smart of you to ask uh, this question. The other thing I'll also add is uh, if you're in, a, I think it was a small shop. Um, when you're looking at 
ROI on fundraising. Um, uh, grant writers and plan giving officers sometimes are the best ROI. That's not maybe necessarily true for every organization, but for many, those are for two really um, good positions to consider for um, for um, um, return on your investment. So, yes, I, I think this is a really good question. Practically, how would a, how would kind of a, a, a group get a land giving program together to, to capture this wealth transfer that we're in? Um, the two things I would say one, um, you don't have to start with 50 person budget, you don't have to wait until you have a dozen people or more um, who put you in their will. You can start with two or three, uh, one of them could be you. Uh, you could have the them um, with you know a, a former executive director or a former board chair or current board chair. Um, and so find people that are close to you, find um, the ones that care about certain things, and then once you have that uh, story, tell the story about what they care about and how they want to make uh, uh, change going forward. The second thing I would say, which makes plan giving a little unique, is um, I think a lot of times with major gifts, it's kind of on the organization's timeline. Um, I've always, I've always said that you know the, the three really good components of a, of a of a major gift app is does it have urgency, does it have a picture, and does it have a price. With plan giving, it doesn't quite work that way, right? It's not really on your timeline. Certainly, uh, when when you receive the gift, it's not your timeline. But but also when people are putting the organization in their will or their estate plan. It's kind of on their timeline. It's harder to say, okay, great, now please go see your attorney next month. So because of this, I think you just have to be really committed to having this as a piece of your marketing and outreach campaign, um, even though you know you might not see immediate returns. Uh, so say, hey, you know, I just want to continue to be in front of our um, our our donors who care about the most, it might be um, if the right demographic to consider. So, to summarize, um, if I can summarize, <laughs> uh, continue to be focused, be contained, and also you don't have to start um, really big. We also, I guess, if my last answer, we can help with this. We'll talk a little bit about this later on how um, we're putting together some coaching consulting to specifically help with plan giving. We think there's a really important uh, piece of uh, uh, nonprofit development. That's one. And two, uh, we'll announce in the second half, and we're actually going to get bring in an, an expert around this topic. So um, if, if this is something that is uh, on your mind, I'm going to bring you one of the countries um, that plan giving experts in a couple of months to help you guys uh, uh, exactly this. Can I ask a question? Thank you, Tim. Robert's back up. Yes. Robert, uh, big economy comments, risk to the economy, risk to investors and consumers, and risk to gig workers. Hmm. Okay, big comments or thoughts? Gig economy in general. Okay, so Uber being the, the classic one of the, you know, <laughs> you're, you're employed, you're working kind of in a quality of yourself, or just doing things, you know, like one one stop at a time. There's a whole host of other ones out there, obviously, so forth. Um, gig economy does impact our uh, labor statistics because it does actually make it a little bit difficult to determine, you know, that 3.7 figure that I showed earlier. How do we really know? The Bureau of Labor Statistics kind of makes some assumptions in there. And there could be an individual that might be underemployed, for example, that's doing several, you know, gig work to fill in, maybe in a transition between a, a full-time job. Then the other thing that you get on with gig economy is um, benefits, healthcare, and so forth, which is the the classic big part of economy as well. I mean, obviously, it's I think the the gig economy is is certainly there to say. It's an interesting way of uh, reflecting in a way of something that's always been done in the past, but it's made it more um, cohesive, almost to the point of you know unionization in certain gig workers of a similar category. Um, so at the end of the day, though, it is 
a way for to have a certain employee workforce that maybe you're not paying as a full benefits for the you know, shifts that onto the worker versus the company. Um, yeah, to provide additional disposable income, though, taking the other side of that is a is quite frankly a benefit. You'd rather have somebody that can fill in uh, work at some point, get a paycheck to then carry on shooting out of the economy. What's the last point to that again? The gig economy comes risk to the economy, risk to investors and consumers, and risk to gig workers. Yeah. Risk to gig workers and address would be the healthcare side and so lack of uh, collective bargaining or almost uh, being treated as an employee. Risk to the economy overall, that, that's where it's, again, it has to go that person as a paycheck rather than not. So that must be better. Thank you. All right, we're down to a couple questions and we've got about four minutes. Um, last question we just got was, can you talk about what happened in 2022? Why was it negative? So oh, 2022 negative in general. Yeah, yeah. So um, the actual negative is that you saw the stock markets down approximately 18.5%. Uh, the bond market was also down about 16% too. It was just kind of one of those every asset class correlated together during the time period. And the reason it was down was that was the specter of rising inflation. So the mindset of investors were, well, the Fed's going to move interest rates. And quite simply, it, you know, here's the quick and dirty math on that. If you have a, you know, back to my vending machine, my $100 vending machine, if it's, uh, you know, if I loan to somebody to buy that, Getting five percent coupon on that loan, getting these nice five dollar names, five percent it might be okay. But now all of a sudden, if I increase the prevailing interest rate and double it to ten percent, think of what I have now done to the value of that machine. What would somebody else be willing to pay for that vending machine? That would be cut in half uh, by that amount. So no longer is my machine worth hundred dollars; it's now worth fifty. Because it's going to still pay that five dollars, but to make that a ten percent rate of return and not a five, the price is going to come down by half. So that's why you start to see equities; they just have to be priced for interest rates. And uh, you know, in portfolio management, that was a nasty year because it was a really not many places that you could hide. The best that we found was that the short term or what's called low duration uh, bonds. They were less sensitive to rate change. Some floating rate bonds as well, which kind of automatically adjust with the, the rate landscape. Robert? Okay, I don't think we have time for the last one, but I do just want to check you know, any further questions in the audience. Last chance. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is a bit raw and maybe political in some way, shape, or form, but I think in the uh, economic analysis of unemployment and just general population decline, the issue of immigration really hasn't been um, discussed or addressed. Yeah. Um, and it's something that actually is quite positive, according to federal studies and the other um, Perspectives. Uh, I thought maybe you could shed on that, talk a little bit about that. I guess, yeah, yeah, I, I can. And I'll do it obviously in a, a political way. At the end of the day, I was like, I, I represent a big bank. <laughs> so that, but um, no, the every nation needs that workforce. I'm going to go back to that, you know, workers in the field to support the aging, retired population. And what you want for your next generation, your next workforce is, yeah, you do want a better life for them, you want a better, um, your standard of living, um, you know, more access to, to capital to be able to do things and so forth. So all those are positive aspects to, you know, change a good workforce. And here's the thing too, arguably, you could say, I think you're alluding to this, that basically from 21, one of the reasons that we were experiencing Inflation is because there weren't enough workers in the field. 
And the classic way is to say, hey, I need another worker in the field, too. Like, oh, I'm not sure. How much do you make now? I've got to get a tech record while I'm here. You end up with ways to push uh, inflation that way. So, arguably, if you have more, you know, of a population, then great, you wouldn't necessarily have that wage inflation. Then you do get the other side of that argument, which is, well, hang on, would Timbo like that job versus, you know, giving it to the, the next person as well? So, that there is that counter to some of that argument. But when we are in a period of, of underemployment, or when we don't have enough, yes, you need to grow the population somehow. Child birth or immigration, legal immigration. All right, thank you, Robert. Um, we're out of time. I recognize I'm standing between you and a break, so just a couple of quick comments. I want to say, Robert, you have this ability to take complex and complicated information and present it in a way that's understandable. Thank you for another great presentation helping us understand what happened last year and what we should look forward to in the upcoming year and beyond. Um, I just say that how about a round of applause for us? Thank you. Okay. Thank you to every one of you who came out for this portion of the presentation today. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Um, as a reminder, we are recording this presentation. Tell us that earlier. It'll be on our uh, on our website. We've got a couple of days, probably by the end of the week. So if you have college at work, if you want to go back and revisit something, whatever it is, you should be able to do that. Feedback, it's important. Please share. So in your folders, you have a survey. Please fill it out and give it to us. Leave it on the table. Give it to one of the folks at the front table. If you're not able to do it, if you forget, we'll send an email with a link. But this meeting is for you, so we really do want to know which parts work, which parts don't, so that we can adjust it to meet your needs and expectations. Um, again, I just want to say thank you for coloring this foundation. We appreciate your support and trust. Um, we work hard to do what's right by you and provide transparency in this meeting and the ways to do that by not just letting you hear from Robert, but have conversations with you. So, with that, thank you. Jordan, can you hear us? We sure can. Can you hear us? We absolutely can. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, we are excited to be here and uh, excited to talk to everybody today. So I'm going to get right it to it. Um, first of all, it's great to be here live from Alamosa. I felt like I had to say that, have to be a little bit of a newscaster. But um, we are here today with two very special folks who are going to share their experience um, with endowments. Um, so, Max, I wanted to start with you. I was hoping maybe you could introduce yourself, introduce the nonprofit, um, and just talk a little bit about your recent experience with uh, setting up an endowment. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Max Gibson. I'm executive director, and the Local Foods Coalition has been around for 15 years and is working to create a more equitable local food system in the six counties of the San Luis Valley. And our major programs are the Valley Roots Food Hub, which aggregates and distributes food from 110 producers all across the state. Um, we have uh, Cooking Matters cooking classes. We have a policy and assessment arm. Um, and then most important for this conversation is the Rio Grande Farm Park, which is 17 acres right, right in the middle of town. Um, that is on the edge of the Rio Grande River that was originally an elementary school, had a, a number of Guatemalan Mayan refugee families that were growing food there. Um, Chris will talk a little bit about kind of the process of saving that land. Um, but now today it, it has an education center and a commercial farmer incubator program and a public park and trails and is a real gem in Alamosa. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of an endowment was on the table even before I stepped into the organization, um, but it's, it, it's been held up as a kind of a vital way to save that land and, and make sure that long term, as we steward that land, which we have a conservation easement for, um, that kind of regardless of the vagaries of our own funding and programs that might come and go, that we are able to ensure that that land is well cared for and available for public use. 
I know we were just talking about this. Yeah. Um, can everybody hear us all right? Our, we're good. All our, right. Our windy air conditioning, our, our heat is on right now. <laughs> well, great. That's um, an awesome um, way to explain your organization, what you do, and, and how you started looking at endowments. Um, so let me ask, um, from your perspective, I'd love if you could introduce yourself first and then talk a little bit about um, endowments, because it's a little bit unusual for a donor to be um, so well-versed in the idea of an endowment and a long-term investment. So we'd love to hear a little bit more from your perspective about what interested you in this avenue for giving back? Great. So um, I'm a Christina Steinberg, and I'm a family physician here in Alamosa, and I've lived here since 1986. My background um, probably contributed to my involvement with the farm park and the idea about the endowment because um, my family has always been very involved as, when I was a child and growing up, very involved in local community activities as well as um financial support. And so to some extent, when I'm involved with the farm park, I'm channeling my loved ones, which feels very good. Um, the biggest um, involvement that my father had in my hometown was maintaining open space. And um, after his retirement, that was pretty much what he did is be involved in activities that promoted open space. And to put that in perspective, I grew up in Vail. So you can imagine open space is other than up in the mountains is um, very key because it's extremely dense. So I moved to the valley and just did my thing. And then um, this challenge came along where this property along the river that used to be the school and the schools um, consolidated. So it was basically potential open space and it was um, promised um, by the school board to the local foods coalition if they could come up with the funds which they did um, but very quickly that fell apart and it was going to become it was going to be purchased by and become a um, travel trailer uh, resort resort trailer place uh, you know what I mean you know where you come and you bring your motor home and you stay and you enjoy the valley um, and the problem with that was one we already were getting organized to have this be a farm, which it already was a farm, and, and it was going to be paved. And this the the person who was going to develop this motorhome park was actually selling soil, selling topsoil, which sounded like rape to us. And so it became a legal issue. And in the end, with with mediation and a very really kind of cool legal process we were able to purchase the land from this gentleman. And once you have struggled and succeeded, you then have this major responsibility. Um, and I feel like that was a huge um, gift to us. So I wanted the farm park to have long-term sustainability as opposed to just day to day, let's do this this year, let's do this next year. So I got involved in the idea of um, being the initial donor for an endowment and then we had to struggle with how are we going to do this and that's where colorado gibbs comes in and we may we may want to talk i don't want to talk too long but yeah. um you know starting as an individual with just a little bit of financial experience and surrounded by people in a small relatively poor town who have very little financial experience it was it seemed overwhelming that we would finance something and actually manage the finances. And my husband and I already knew about Colorado Gives and what we feel about them is they make donation um, giving easy. Um, they help us do it on Colorado Gives Day, which was just really an act of genius. And then they help us with the paperwork and you know, you get the paperwork back and you're done. It's just so easy. Um, and so when we found out that Colorado Gives actually can um, can manage an endowment, do the endowment, it was sort of like, yeah, boy, if they make it as easy as they make dope, um, Colorado Gives Day, we're in. And we did our due diligence and we interviewed other options. And it was clear that Colorado Gives was going to make it something where we could, we, could, we could work on getting donors but we didn't have to manage finances, which is not our expertise at all. So we're extremely grateful. 
That's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And so what I heard was that you were extremely influenced by your family right. and their work growing up and seeing them uh, commit and give back to open space. Um, I heard that you guys solved a challenge and really right. all came together as a community. So you felt really um, dedicated to the cause. And right. then from there, um, you wanted that to last forever. You wanted your work to be to go on in perpetuity. Exactly. And so came to the conclusion that, you know, an endowment rather than an upfront gift right. made more sense. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, the process for you guys. And um, if there's any other feedback you have to other nonprofits, if they're considering um, an endowment. Well, we, we had a series of board meetings. I mean, we, we had extra board meetings in between our normal board meetings to um, to talk this through, and we we extended an invitation to to Dr. Steinberg and a couple other community members that that had kind of similar levels of involvement, and um, and we tried things out. We we did research on Color to Gives, and um, Tim was very helpful. gave multiple presentations. We had presentations from other investment groups. Um, we brought in other local nonprofit that has an endowment of their own with their own kind of internal management structure and just kind of learned about and weighed out what these different options could look like. And it, as Chris was saying, it became very clear very quickly that Colorado Gives was the easiest approach and that Colorado Gives is already kind of a name brand through the nonprofit scene in Colorado. It didn't take that much selling. It was it was a real relief for the board that we weren't going to have to make our own investment decisions every year. We weren't going to have to, you know, manage coordination and communication between multiple boards. Um, that we could just know that it was in a safe place and that we would get looped in when we needed to, and not much beyond that. Yeah, share the responsibility of of, of managing that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, and as to wrap things up, I'd love to hear from you and from you um, if there's something that you would tell a donor. Um, so from a donor's perspective, if there were things that you could share with them about endowments and why they should potentially invest, what would you say to it? Well, I would say, you know, I would explain what an endowment is. Um, you can give money that is spent, you can you can dedicate it to something that is needed today, or you can think about the future. And you have to explain that the endowment is, you know, the, the money is held, but then the, um, the income can be spent so that, you know, oftentimes with grants, we have a real problem because, you know, most of these nonprofits um, that I'm familiar with in the Valley, they, get, they live on grants, but a grant doesn't pay the electric bill. And then they struggle with that and they're asking for help with the electric bill. Well, if you have an endowment, you've got a, um, a fixed growing, presumably, um, sum um, growing with donors and growing with um, the financial world. But then there is that money that is not earmarked for something. You're not locked in. So you can, you know, get new light bulbs and <laughs> you can buy wheelbarrows. Um, and so I liked the idea of that, flex, that having both those things. And I was blessed to have the means to do it. And it's not me that is really donating it. It's my father, Thomas Steinberg. So yeah. Yeah. And it, it, even in the best of times, grants don't cover everything that we want to have covered at the farm park. Um, but then it's in my mind all the time that, you know, recessions come and programs get shuttered and things change. But we own this land and we have a responsibility to the community to make it available. So this makes sure that that somebody long term is there to open and close the gates, pick up the trash, you know, fix fix equipment that's breaking down. We at, at a bare minimum, we can keep this space open and and being used by the community. Well, and in those bad times, that's really when the farm park is, is, is helping the community more. I mean, we have families, we have family farmers and the, and the commercial farmers that um, at times of unemployment have lived off their produce. Yep. Um, and it feels very good yep. that when there are other bad times, which there will be, that resource is there, whether they're selling their produce or yep. feeding it to their friends and their families. Yep. So. 
Any final thoughts on endowments, future plans for the farm park, um, or anything else that you wanted to share with our audience about your experience with Colorado Gives Foundation? Well, I think one of our big challenges is we are beginners in, in, in getting this endowment going and we have plans, but I think Colorado Gives can probably help us figure out the words to use with our volunteers and our community members who will also plan to contribute to the endowment. And um, I think we have a lot to learn about fundraising and I look forward to um, getting some insight about that. Wonderful. Yep. Wonderful, yes, certainly. Step one, get the endowment. Right. Step two, expand and start exactly. talking about the endowment. Right. Oh, well, this has been so wonderful. Thank you both for doing this and Thank sharing you. your thoughts and your experience with everybody. How's it going on that end? We can't see you. But are there any questions? Thank you. I think we're maybe running a little low on, on time for questions, but two of the amazing things that I've heard, one, um, when, when Kristen, um, or, <laughs> Forgive me if I'm wrong, maybe Max said this. It's when, I think Chris said, it's when uh, during those down times that your services are needed the most. And I think that's such a great case and reminder for the value of, of your vision here. And then I also love when you said, when you are challenged and you succeed, you now have a responsibility. What a neat thing that I think we can all um, kind, of, kind of think about and, and, and we all know how to uh, and, engage our community uh, who think like minds like that. So thank you all so, so much. Um, if there are any hearing questions for Chris or Max, um, send me, we'll, we'll, we'll shoot them an email uh, or give them a phone call or connect you. Uh, we are very inspired. So um, again, uh, Jordan, thank you. Max and Chris, thank you so much for making a tremendous impact in the Valley. Grateful for your time this morning. Uh, the local police coalition. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just love it. As, as our name reflects, it's so good to hear from organizations across the entire state of Colorado. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that they were able to join up today and share their story. Really, if you do have any lingering questions on Hey, this is an opportunity to talk to a donor directly about what inspired her and her family. Um, let us know if we're happy to relay those questions. Um, now, as we virtually travel, I looked it up, it's 216 miles. 285? Uh, 216 miles back from Alamosa. I would love to welcome up. Pam Ryer from the Action Center and, and John Bogart. Uh, the Action Center is a human service organization here in Lakewood, and we have asked them to join us today um, because they are both very intentional and rather visionary in opportunities for their programs by not just investing in today but also uh, prioritizing growth and sustainability uh, for the future. So also uh, prioritizing growth and sustainability uh, for the future. So, Pam, John, thanks so much for being with us today. How do we look? All right. You look great. Great. Yeah. great. That's good. Thanks for having us. Well, Pam, um, can we start with you? I would just love to give you the opportunity to share a little bit about the wonderful work the Action Center is doing um, for those uh, those who might not know uh, about your organization. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the Action Center has been around since 1968. We're a 55-year-old uh, comprehensive human service organization that was founded by volunteers in the 60s when uh, they recognized uh, a lot of income disparity and people who were really struggling to get by. And we have stayed true to those roots for all of these years. Um, we continue to grow and be one of the largest, most comprehensive human service organizations in Denver Metro. Um, we have seen an increase in the need, unfortunately, for our organization. And so our organization has continued to grow and expand to meet that need. We have three tiers of support that we offer to the community. 
Um, there's the immediate need services, so there are things like our free clothing bank, our free food and grocery, a, f a mailbox for folks who are unhoused, and um, ad additional services to sort of stabilize and support people who are really um, the most vulnerable in our community. And then our second tier of support is the financial assistance support. And that comes in the form of uh, essential rent assistance, utility assistance, we have an emergency bill pay program. So that when folks in our community hit a bump that for maybe you or me wouldn't mean so much, a, a flat tire, a broken down vehicle, we're able to help them stay moving forward and not lose that employment and become even more destabilized. And then our third tier of support is really our long-term work with community members with our family coaching program. And in that, we walk beside community members who are facing all kinds of different challenges to their ongoing stability for their families. And we help them to look at the various aspects of their lives and find the vulnerable spots and choose the place where they want to go forward and work on goals and continue to stabilize their lives with our assistance and connecting them to our resources and other resources in the community. Thank you. If you haven't visited the Action Center, um, you might not know, but comprehensive is a great uh, adjective for, for what you do. They, they have such a great space with resources um, well positioned throughout, throughout their, their facility. Um, John, I think, I think there's sometimes a bit of tension between current financial needs, current financial stability, and future sustainability. So, um, I, you know, how does the Action Center balance those two, those, those needs to, to provide services now, but also position yourselves uh, for a temple long-term vision? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's always a struggle. I mean, I've been in development in nonprofit my whole professional career, and I've never seen an organization that had enough resources, all the needs that were coming to them. There's always, um, there's always a challenge, and unfortunately, there always will be that challenge. And so, when you look at the dollars coming in and the needs, you have to balance that. Um, our heart is always to serve everybody, and, and just let the floodgates roll. But again, that's not a long-term sustainable kind of concept. Um, you know, if a, a donor gives us an extra $10,000, the temptation is easy to say, well, we're gonna put it right in and let's spend it immediately. Um, that, because that'll, that'll help us serve maybe an extra 10 people this month. But you know, if we put it away into an endowment, now I can serve those 10 people forever, um, those additional 10 people. And that's certainly a lot more. And so we're always trying to, to balance those needs. Um, I came from an organization where I worked for 17 years. It was at a very huge endowment program. So when I came to the action center, I'm like, we don't have an endowment? <laughs> we need to get an endowment. We need to do something. But again, the needs were great. And we're like, well, how, John, that's too soon. You're, you're pushing too soon. There's too many great needs. And so we had to try to figure out how to balance what that looked like. Before we go back to Pam, you know, John, one of the reasons I really want you to share part of your story is because um, you have endowment and long-term funds with us. Um, you have a, a really neat, intentional uh, view of your resources, and that's led you to um, kind of a cascading model of building funds for your future. Can you share with us kind of what that cascading model of your investments look like? Yeah, it's about having conversations with our board about current stability and, and meeting current needs, but also looking long term. How far down the road can we get? And then balancing those those needs and those demands. And so what we've been building slowly, I mean, it's taken a while. We've, we've been working on this for four or five years now. Um, but getting to the point where we know, well, how much do we need in, in our checking account, our business checking account? Is it five months operating cash? Is six, what is it that makes sense for the action center? And then how do we get to where we're maintaining that number? Once we get to that number, then we said, all right, now what can we do with the excess that's coming in? And so just pushing it into the, uh, the program. So we said, well, let's go to a long-term investment fund over at uh, Colorado Gives Foundation. And let's just start letting that money flow into that fund for us. So we know we've got 
six months of operating cash. Great, we're good. Um, our finance director does a really great job of forecasting 12 months out. So we know we can maintain that number. So that means if I get that extra $10,000, there's no reason I can't put it into the long-term investment fund. Um, and for us, it, um, the long-term investment fund really works well because it's not completely locked up. Um, it does have some level of liquidity. So that was a concern of the board is, do I lock up money forever and ever and I lose the liquidity of it? And so we want to just continue to build that long-term fund to a number that we're comfortable with. And once we've reached that number, which we did this one, <laughs> um, we're excited. Now we can really feel comfortable about now excess funds like a legacy gift coming in. We can now put that into um, a permanent endowment that, that we don't have to worry about it sacrificing or risking our future. Because we know we have this here, we have this here. Let's just continue to build that, which means long-term we're going to be able to serve a lot more people um, in the long run as opposed to looking for a short you know, gain on, oh, let's serve these hundred people real quick. And so that's kind of our, our plan that we're trying to slowly build. Wonderful. If, if anyone was here a few years ago, uh, the Action Center got to share a little bit about that long-term fund. And, um, um, and and as John said, it has a little bit more liquidity. In fact, as I recall the story, um, uh, you, you used some of it um, for kind of a capital purchase. And the story goes that, that Kelly Duncan met them in the middle of a snowstorm on a Friday afternoon to deliver a check. So um, It's true. It's true. There you go. It's not one of those, I walked five miles up the hill both ways. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing um, about how you're able to use those. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear that throughout the history they, they've, they've served um, the vision and uh, the strategic vision of, of the Action Center well. Um, it's interesting for me because the Action Center is such a staple of Lakewood and the Jefferson County community. Um, so it's sometimes, odd for me to think that you guys have had just a remarkable journey to where you are today. And as you just said, it's taken time. Um, so I guess I always like to try to pull wisdom from that experience. So, so Pam, what advice would you give to people in this room who maybe are, are where you all were five years ago um, in a similar position? What, what would you say to them um, as, as they explore what, what their journey might look like? That's a great question. I think in some ways we're the poster child for doing a better job of long-term thinking and planning. Um, when I got to the Action Center and shortly thereafter pulled John in, um, we, were, we were in a challenging place. Um, the organization had become destabilized by leadership change and by some changes in the economy and losing some major grants and needing to um, shore up our team, our fundraising team, and so we were in a we were in a really difficult and precarious spot. And as John has said, we didn't have big endowment funds at that point in time. There hadn't been yet the ability to think long term and strategically. So we didn't have sitting at uh, Colorado Blues Foundation money that we knew that we could lean on. And so it was a lot of lessons from that experience, not just about long-term planning, but also about when, you know, organizations are just like people. We hit bumps in the road, and it happens to everyone. And so when it happens, how are you gonna handle it? And I think, for me, the lesson, not just from this experience, but from watching other peers um, in the nonprofit world go through tough times, um, the, the real key is to be transparent. Talk about the challenges you're having. Talk about how you got there. Talk about your plans for regaining stability. Be open. In some ways, be vulnerable, because everyone knows this is part of life. You know, For individuals, for organizations, as I said, we all go through this. So don't hide it. You know, Come out and talk about what got you in this situation and how you plan to fix it. That was like number one key lesson for us. Um, number two, you have to invest in your core team. Find someone like John who brings a tremendous amount of experience and expertise and don't be afraid to make an upfront investment even when you don't have a lot to spend um, because it's the strength of your team, it's the building of the culture, the building of, 
um, the resilience of your team that is going to then bring back the trust with community. That you're going to be able to show that you know, the team that you have is you know, absolutely 100% committed to the mission, is committed to delivering on that mission, and is able to do so. And it allows then for real relationship building to happen and real trust building to continue. Um, so I think those are two really key things. And then again, thinking when you can, as often as you can, to think about planning for the future. Um, talk to Colorado Gives Foundation about, even if it's starting small, thinking about how you plan for the days that aren't going to be quite as good to you um, so that you know that you can get through those bumps because they are going to happen. Um, as I look at the clock, I would have loved to save a little time for questions, uh, but I want to honor everyone's time here. So are you guys available to, to stick around for a couple minutes afterwards and field any questions from folks? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank well, you again for having us. Thank you so much, Pam and John, and, and please relay a huge thanks from all of us to uh, the staff and volunteers of the Action Center. Thank you. Our hope is that one or both of those stories um, maybe had a piece in there that was inspiring or intriguing or even just made sense. Oh, that's something that we could explore a little bit further. Um, as now, as Kelly mentioned earlier, I'm just excited to hear a few new ways that we are engaging and supporting our endowment partners. So, um, in the last few minutes, I just want to highlight some um, really neat new things. First, we are introducing a new program to offer free internal coaching and consulting uh, to our endowment partners. As you just heard from this example, we work with the, uh, nonprofit partners of all shapes and sizes. And so, especially if you think your fundraising and development staff could use, uh, could use our team uh, and our resources, we would love to sit down with you and listen and learn and even help craft some specific tactics uh, to help you succeed. So, that's number one. The second, uh, as you heard from the Action Center, we talked about various funds different kinds of funds that you could, you could utilize. And we want to make sure that your investments with us are working to serve your vision, um, as we just heard with, with from John and Pam. We're also excited to be continuing on the road to 100% EMG screened funds and to ensure that we're not only making good happen in the distribution of funds, but also uh, in its investing. So if you want to learn any more about different kind of funds that we have, or about what a uh, value-aligned and ethical investing means, uh, please let us please let us know. Third, uh, we we put on a number of events throughout the year. This is just one that uh, we we put on that hopefully has some useful content for you. Um, we're excited to announce that in less than two months, we will be bringing in uh, really a premier uh, gifting and development expert in the country, uh, Brian Klont. Um, if, if you've heard of him before, we are very excited to have him come in. Um, we're going to invite our endowment, uh, endowment partners and donor advisement holders, anyone here uh, who would like to utilize his expertise, uh, we would be excited to have you join us. Um, we also have workshops and webinars and other events throughout the year. Um, all of those are designed to explore the trends and tactics uh, around nonprofit leadership and funders. Finally, we are very excited to announce um, two new endowment-related grants. Uh, for multiple years, we've been offering a 10% uh, matching grant for organizations to establish an endowment with us. Now, we are extending that in two new ways. Uh, one is when an organization who maybe has under $100,000 has aspirations to grow it. We want to help you. Um, we want to help you get there. So um, that's one of the areas where we are extending this grant. The other is exploring a bigger initiative or even a campaign that might involve an endowment building component. So um, these are two really neat ways that we want to continue to walk alongside you, not just when you open a fund with us, but but to continue to help grow that fund. 
All of these materials here are also in your packets. Um, so again, uh, whether you are an organization, you're, you're large or small, or wherever you are across the state, uh, whatever your impact area is, we hope that there is something here um, that would be a good resource for you. If anything here does resonate, uh, you can scan this QR code. Um, that guy is much more handy. So um, scan this QR code. I would love to personally talk to you. Kelly's been part. Ken's are out there. Our staff raised their hand. Um, if you have an unrelated question to anything today and you want to talk about Colorado Kids Day, Erica is right here. So whenever you would like to do uh, we would just, our, our role is to, is to serve and support you. Um, you've heard Kelly say that we firmly believe in good for everyone. Uh, my definition of that, uh, especially as it relates to the talent growth, is we want to make sure that organizations like you have the resources you need to serve the communities that you need. Um, that, for us, is good for everyone, and we're very, very excited to walk along with you and partner our own kids. With that, I would love to turn it back over to Kelly Duncan for uh, final remarks. We have to I'm kidding. Right? Yeah, I think I'm kidding. Um, start by just a huge thank you to all of our speakers today. So thank you, Robert. I think I heard more than one person saying, you look at the charts he's going to present and you want to glaze over and then you hear Robert talk about it and you leave it want to hear more. So thank you again for making complex, complicated, so attainable and interesting. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ken Kerwin, our CFO, for moderating question and answer, Daniel Martin, both as a service uh, as a finance and investment committee chair, as well as joining us this morning. Thank you to Tim. Thank you to Jordan. Thank you to Max and Christina, who may not be here uh, to hear this, and to Pam and to John. We are so thrilled to have you with us today. But I want to send an even bigger thank you to all of you. You are engaging in philanthropy, whether you're a nonprofit endowment partner, who is working every single day to serve our communities, whether you are a donor advisor who has put money into supporting community efforts, we are absolutely humbled to be a part of your good work. And so I want to thank you, and I hope you walk away today knowing that we're on this journey with you. We are literally invested in your future, whether it's a future of an endowment or a donor advice fund, and we're thrilled to get to be a part of it. So thank you for trusting us. Thank you for giving us time this morning. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks for taking your time.